In this video, I'll show you how I created this custom carrier board for the Latte Panda Mew. I'll be retracing the steps that I took, but this video should serve as a resource for anyone who wants to design their own. The Mew itself is a compute module designed to plug into a DDR4 SODIMM format slot. Latte Panda does offer two carrier boards for sale, the full evaluation and light carrier, but the real beauty of this is that you can create your own and do pretty much anything you want with it. In my case, I used it to create this, a custom cyberdeck, basically a bespoke portable PC. Check out my last video if you haven't seen it. It's a high-level overview of the full build, but here I'll walk through the design process of the carrier board specifically. First, a word on the Mew module itself. There are currently three models available at the time of recording. All are interchangeable since they have the same pin layout. In all cases, some form of cooling is required. Don't try running one of these without it. The power and performance settings can be adjusted in BIOS if you'd like to use a passive cooling system, for example. All three versions have these connectors along the top edge. I use the one on the right, which is an EDP cable, to send video to an 11.6 inch touchscreen, and the connector in the middle is what actually controls those touch functions. The nice thing about these connectors is that you can use a screen without having to add any additional components to the PCB, but for everything else, you'll need to break out these pins along the bottom edge. There's a total of 260, but 65 of those are just connected to ground and 11 R4 power input. Now, a quick disclaimer, I'm not an electronics engineer. I just do this for fun, and I learned it all by watching tutorials. So if I say something that's not quite accurate, please let me know in the comments. I won't be offended. So let's dive in and take a look at the KiCad file. This is for the light carrier. First, we'll open up the schematic file. It's divided into the following subsections, power, fan temp, PCI Express, USB, Gigabit Ethernet, HDMI, GPIO, M.2 E and M key, and finally a page for the Mew itself. When you click on any of these, it will enter a sub-page with the schematics for those parts. Mainly, I'm going to be removing the parts that I don't need, but there is one thing conspicuously absent that I need to add. I recommend that you make a copy of this project and work from that file so that you can have the original as a reference later on. Now, a lot of people watching this will probably want to keep some of these features, and even add more of their own, but this should still serve as a resource to help you understand how to set everything up. Rather than actually deleting all these parts, I'm just telling KiCad to basically ignore them by checking these boxes in each symbol's properties. I don't need the PCI Express slot, as cool as that is, because what I'm building is a very compact device that's not really focused on gaming, so that's the first thing that I'll be cutting. We can go ahead and get rid of the power for PCIe sections, since that's now gone. I'm also cutting the USB-C power connector because this will be powered off of an internal battery bank with its own charging circuitry. Ethernet can also be removed in my case. I would actually love to keep this since it's a nice thing to have, but space is going to be really tight in this build, and honestly, I would probably never use it. So that brings us to our first addition. I'm adding a screw terminal in parallel to the DC power jack, which will connect to the battery bank. In this same page, I also slightly modified the sleep slash power on jumper. In the original light carrier board, this is a three pin header that sticks out and has to be bridged with a little jumper that selects whether the device turns on when power is connected or from the press of a button. I don't really need that option, so I'm just gonna use this and a footprint that connects pin one and two. I also got rid of the reset button because I simply don't need it. The reference file is also missing any sort of audio output system other than what you get over HDMI, so we need to add something like that using an audio decoder slash amplifier chip. I chose to use this Max98357 chip. This takes I2S digital audio signals and decodes them into analog, then amplifies them for use with a speaker. I just added this circuit to the main page for the Mu. Unfortunately, this did not end up working, since I2S is not yet supported by the BIOS. I talked about that more in the Cyberdeck video, but basically, I had to use an external USB audio device. The other thing I added was more USB connections, but not the usual type. I need to be able to connect to my keyboard, but I don't want to use up any of my four ports, and I also need it to be in a different location on the board. To help figure out how to do this, I looked at a couple of other custom boards that people had designed. I used this project as a reference design, another custom carrier board designed by GitHub user Donder Strahl, link in the description. It's meant to be a Nano ITX compatible board, and it has extra front panel USB connections. Now, since we're working from an existing file, the footprints for everything are already assigned, except for the parts that I added, of course. For the extra USB ports, I'm using 4-pin JST connectors, which look like this. And for the speaker, I'm using the 2-pin version of the same type. I also downloaded the footprint for the Max98357 chip, 
plus the screw terminal. For the power switch, I needed one that would face sideways, so I found this and got the footprint for it. At this point, you'll want to run the electrical rules checker tool. You'll probably get some errors and warnings. Some of these may not matter. This one is just saying that it's not being driven by a power pin, but it is. It's just going through a fuse first, so we can ignore that. I'm not gonna go through what all of these mean, but some of these could be actual issues depending on what you did to the schematic, so do your own research. So that's really all I needed to do for the schematic. Now it was time to lay out the PCB. But before that, let me tell you a little bit about the company that actually produced the parts for this project, JLC PCB, who are also today's sponsor. JLC PCB provides easy, affordable, and reliable PCB production and assembly solutions, which empowers you to develop your projects efficiently. It's extremely easy to get started. Just upload your design files and get an instant quote that updates in real time as you select your options. There's tons of ways you can customize your PCBs, including base material, solder mask and silkscreen color, surface finish, and many more options. JLC PCB offers affordable prices with one to eight layer boards starting at just $2. And don't miss out on their $30 off coupon for top quality six layer PCBs with a free upgrade to their premium 2U ENIG gold plated finish. Because JLC PCB does all of their production in-house, turnaround time is lightning fast and quality control is maintained to strict standards. As you'll see later in this video, the parts that I ordered from JLC PCB not only looked fantastic but worked perfectly. Easy to use, affordable to make, and reliable to trust. You can always count on JLC PCB. The open source reference project contains this design file, but I'm pretty much just going to delete all of this and start over. For reference though, you can open this up in another KiCad window and flip between them as needed. All right, first things first. Size was a major constraint in this project, so I had to figure out how big to make it. I settled on 160 by 80 millimeters. I began by selecting the edge cuts layer and drawing a box with those dimensions. So now the challenge is just to get everything to fit inside of there. We can now click Update PCB from Schematic, and that'll import all of the components into the PCB design window. Those can be placed off to the side for now. Then it's just a matter of moving everything inside the board's outline in a way that makes sense. Obviously the Muse mounting area takes up the most space. Following that, the biggest parts are the M.2 slots, then the USB and HDMI ports. I placed all of the USB ports here on the left side, along with the power switch. I also stuck the CMOS battery clip up here in this area as well. Then I put the HDMI port along the top edge so that I'll easily be able to plug in an external monitor. I also placed that barrel jack next to it. Next to that is the screw terminal, which will connect to the battery. Below that, I placed the two M.2 slots. And finally, I added two 4-pin JST connectors that will allow me to connect to external USB lines. These only have two data pins each, so they will be limited to USB 2.0, but that's fine. I also put the audio processing chip here with a 2-pin connector that'll go to the speaker. So that's all the major stuff taken care of. Now we need to place those minor things like resistors, capacitors, MOSFETs, diodes, LEDs, resistors... Did I say resistors already? Yeah, there's a lot of these things. But luckily, the placement of most of them isn't super critical, and we can refer to the original file here. This will be a four-layer board, the first one that I've personally designed. This is mainly due to the number of components and the fact that the USB, HDMI, and M.2 traces need to be run over top of a ground layer for impedance control. The reference file is already set up this way, so we'll just go with that. The stack up is gonna go like this. The top layer will be signal plus routed DC power. Most of the parts will be connected to this layer. The second layer is just going to be a single ground plane. A large percentage of the signal traces are on the top layer, so this ensures that those will be over top of a ground plane like they need to be. The third layer is power. I'll be putting the 5 and 3.3 volt traces here. These connect to various things throughout the board like the USB and M.2 slots. But the rest of this layer will just be a large ground section, so that the signal traces on the bottom are adjacent to ground as they need to be. The fourth layer, which is on the bottom of the board, will once again be signal traces and routed DC power. The power comes in through either the barrel jack or the terminal, which are connected in parallel, then it flows through these big protection diodes. I created a wide channel using the draw polygon tool rather than the trace tool to make sure that it could carry plenty of current. This is probably way overkill, but Better safe than sorry. I had to use a bunch of vias to transfer this from the front to the back of the board, and then once again to the front. Maybe not ideal, but I was limited on space. The hardest challenge was running all of the signal traces. 
Not only are there a ton of them, but some are matched pairs that need to have very specific sizes and distances from each other, as well as clearance from other tracks. Again, I referenced the open source file heavily here, and also read up on USB and HDMI routing standards. For example, the expected impedance of USB is 90 ohms, with a minimum clearance from other tracks of at least half a millimeter. These signal pairs also have to be length matched. And for that, I used KeyCAD's tool, which lets you see the distance of each track and manually adjust it by adding these serpentine sections. These matched pairs also should have ground transfer vias right next to wherever they switch sides on the board, so I added those wherever I could. My strategy here was to try to get the data lines done first, since their parameters are much more critical than stuff like the power button, battery, and fan. One trick I used to make sure that I had enough clearance was to create these little squares on the silk screen layer with the minimum dimensions required. I used these to mark the distance from trace to trace, then deleted them once the design was finished. With all of the traces laid out, I filled out the remaining portions of the board with ground planes, which is standard practice, and also used a grid of vias to stitch all those ground planes together. And of course, what PCB would be complete without some custom silkscreen text and graphics? So I added my channel logo, called this the Latte Panda Cyberdeck Carrier, and threw in some other helpful notes. You'll want to make sure you run the design rules checker before exporting the file. Errors need to be fixed, but warnings may or may not matter, depending on what they are. For example, here it's just telling me that I'm missing this fiducial mark, but that doesn't really matter. After checking the schematic and layout probably a dozen times, I was feeling relatively confident that it would all work, but first I needed to assign actual part numbers to all of those components. I wanted to make the whole ordering and manufacturing process as quick and painless as possible. So I decided to just go with LCSC Electronics parts entirely. A lot of the components in the reference file did have notes which gave you a part number or by link. Some of them provide a URL which, when you paste it into your browser, takes you to szlcsc.com. That's all in Chinese, however, there's this number here. And if you go to lcsc.com and paste that in, you'll find that it's the same part. With a combination of that approach, and simply researching a few things on my own, I was able to find everything I needed here. I added the ID numbers to a custom field in KiCad and called that LCSC part. I did this for all of the components that had to use a specific model, such as the slot for the MU itself, USB ports, HDMI, M.2 slots, mounting posts, MOSFETs, and diodes, but skip the really basic stuff like resistors, capacitors, and LEDs. Those things are basically interchangeable in terms of manufacture, they just need to have the correct footprint and value. So for example, this capacitor needs to have a footprint size known as 0603 and a value of 22 microfarads rated at 10 volts. There's a plugin for KiCad that exports your project in a ready-to-go zip file that you can upload to JLC PCB. You just click it, leave the options on default, and hit generate. That will create several files in a folder called production. On JLC PCB's website, create an account if you haven't already and click order now. Then upload the zip file. Now we can start selecting options. The website auto-detected that this is a four-layer board from the file that I uploaded and kept the thickness at the standard 1.6 millimeter, and the base material is FR4. The minimum order is five units, so be aware of that, you're gonna end up with some extras. I stuck with the standard green solder mask since it was the cheapest and fastest to produce. I did change the surface finish to ENIG, which is gold plating. Gold is the best electrical conductor, so even though this option costs more, I felt like it was worth it. I left pretty much everything under the high spec options with the default settings, except I checked the box for confirm production file and remove mark. Now, because I don't have the skill, patience, or tools to solder all of these tiny parts together myself, I opted to have everything assembled by JLC PCB. This does increase the cost quite a bit, but for me it's worth it. I designed this board so that it has 100% of the parts on the top side. You certainly don't have to do the same, but it may increase the cost if you don't. Because of this, I can leave this option set to top side. PCBA quantity is how many of the boards you want to be actually assembled. I went ahead and chose to have all five assembled because otherwise I'd have three useless boards with no parts on them. I did select confirm parts placement here and I'm glad that I did. The M.2 mounting post turned out to be the wrong size, but they caught it and I was able to fix this and resubmit my order. Otherwise, I left it all default. Now we can hit next. 
review the generated image of what the PCB will look like, and then upload the bill of materials, or BOM, and the CPL file, which is basically a bunch of coordinates. This is the file called Positions in the Production folder. Now click Process BOM and CPL. I get an error saying that TP2 and TP4 don't exist, but those were just some copper test pads that were in the original version, which I removed. So I'll click Continue. Now it's time to select all the parts that didn't get imported in the last step. For each component, just click on the magnifying glass and search for the type of part that you need. Find one that fits the bill and click Select. Just make sure that these do match the footprint from KiCad. You also might have some parts that are out of stock, so in that case you'll need to find an equivalent that fits on the board. I recommend checking every single part and verifying that it matches not only the electrical characteristics needed, but also has the right footprint. Then hit Next. This will take you to a screen where you can confirm or edit the parts placement. You can immediately see that there's a couple of things wrong here. The HDMI, battery holder, and one of the USB ports are all rotated 90 degrees off from what they should be. We can use this button to rotate them to the correct position. Upon closer inspection, there's also a couple of other issues. These ESD protection chips also need to be fixed. You can pull up the keycad file and check where pin 1 is actually supposed to be. These JST connectors are also flipped 180 degrees off from what they should be and need to be rotated, but more importantly, the main MU slot is not quite in the right position. This needs to be moved up. You can switch to the 3D mode by clicking this button. There are some registration features like this hole in the board that you can use to line it up properly. You can use the arrow keys to move parts around. I highly suggest you double check everything before hitting submit. If a part is in the right place, but rotated the wrong way, it's not going to work and may damage other components when powered on. Once you're positive everything is good to go, you can click next. That'll take you to a page with a breakdown of all the costs. In my case, I selected five fully assembled boards, so the cost per unit is actually not bad for a custom product like this. From there, you can add it to your cart and check out. The boards I ordered arrived after a couple weeks, and they worked great. Now, at the time I'm recording this, there is a bit of a trade war between the US and China over tariffs. The only reason that I bring this up is because it is going to affect the cost of custom-made boards like this if you're located in the United States like I am. I'm not going to argue with people in the comments about whether tariffs are good or bad. That's not my area of expertise. I'm just making you aware that this does affect the overall cost of a project like this. Anyway, I hope that you found this video helpful if you're considering building something like this for yourself. I still skimmed over a ton of stuff, but hopefully this puts people on the right track. I know it's a little bit different than my normal type of content, but I wanted to make a deeper dive into the more technical aspects of the project for the people who are looking for that. And lastly, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everybody who has subscribed to this channel. I'm almost at 100,000, and that is incredible. I never expected that when I uploaded my first CNC video. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.